At this point in our video measurement series, I'm going to move into a discussion of linear waveform distortions. Linear distortions are those distortions that are independent of signal amplitude. In other words, they affect the waveform in the same way, regardless of chrominance or luminance amplitude. Linear distortions are usually the result of a system's inability to uniformly transfer signal components at all frequencies. Television signals contain signal components that range from low frequency field rate information up to fine detailed brightness information in the 3 to 5 megahertz range. Chrominance information, of course, is centered around the 3.58 megahertz color subcarrier. In order to perfectly reproduce the picture, information at all of these frequencies must be able to pass through the system without distortion. In physical systems, however, the phase and amplitude transfer characteristics will be different at different frequencies. These differences are the result of linear distortions, and you need to be able to measure them in order to characterize a system. Linear waveform distortions are often classified according to the frequency of the signal components that are affected by the distortion. Four categories have been defined, short time, line time, field time, and long time distortions. The four categories cover the entire video spectrum, with the fastest signal components being in the short time group and the slowest in long time. Separate measurements, which don't distinguish between amplitude and phase distortions, are made for the four categories. Since the categories correspond to familiar television time intervals, such as a line or a field, it's easy to correlate the distortions with what you see in the picture or on a waveform monitor display. In this video, I'm going to concentrate on short time distortions, which are those distortions in the 125 nanosecond to 1 microsecond range. Short time distortions can affect the television picture in a variety of ways. These distortions cause ringing, or overshoot and undershoot, in fast edges and pulses. So what you're most likely to see is fuzzy vertical edges that have been blurred by this ringing. You might also notice some color artifacts near vertical edges in the picture, since ringing can sometimes be interpreted as chrominance information. Short time distortions are measured with specially shaped pulses referred to as sine squared pulses. The most common example of a sine squared pulse is the familiar 2T pulse, which appears in many NTSC combination signals. We use sine squared pulses for television system testing because TV systems are bandwidth limited. In other words, only those signal components with a frequency below a certain cutoff, usually 4 or 5 megahertz for NTSC, are allowed to pass through the system. Signal components with frequencies higher than the specified cutoff are attenuated by the low pass filter at the transmitter. Square waves or edges with very fast rise times have energy at frequencies beyond the bandwidth limit of a television system. If you put fast edges through the system, the out-of-band components will be attenuated and phase shifted and will cause severe ringing in the signal you observe at the output. This will mess up the signal to the point that you can't tell very much about the in-band distortions that you're trying to measure. This problem is solved by using sine squared pulses, which are bandwidth limited themselves. Since virtually all of the energy in these pulses lies within the range of interest, you don't have to worry about out-of-band components. Here's a 2T sine squared pulse displayed on a waveform monitor. As you can see, it looks like part of a sine wave. Mathematically, this shape is obtained by squaring a half cycle of a sine wave, which is where the sine squared nomenclature comes from. Sine squared pulses are identified on the basis of their half amplitude duration, or HAD, which is the pulse width measured at 50% of the pulse amplitude. We generally work with pulses that are multiples of the time interval T, such as 1T, 2T, or 12.5T. T is a time interval that correlates directly with the bandwidth of the system that's being tested. T is the Nyquist interval, or 1 divided by 2 times the nominal bandwidth. For NTSC, this nominal bandwidth is taken to be 4 MHz, which yields a time of 125 nanoseconds for T. This 2T pulse therefore measures 250 nanoseconds across the half amplitude point. There is negligible energy in a sine squared pulse at frequencies above 1 divided by the half amplitude duration, so there's very little energy in a 2T pulse above 4 megahertz. Clearly then, a 2T pulse is very well suited to testing NTSC systems. The edges of signal components, such as white bars, are also specified in terms of T. A T rise time bar, for example, has a 10% to 90% rise time of nominally 1T, or 125 nanoseconds. 
A T-rise edge contains energy out to 8 megahertz, although most of it is concentrated at lower frequencies. As I noted earlier, short time distortions show up as ringing, overshoot or undershoot in sine squared pulses and rise times. If I introduce some distortion into this signal path, you can see that ringing appears at the edge of the 2T pulse. Here's an undistorted white bar with a 1T rise time. If I again introduce the distortion, you can see that ringing appears at the edge of the bar. Now let's take a look at how to quantify this ringing. The short time distortion measurement method most commonly employed in the United States is specified in IEEE standard 511-1979. This method involves obtaining a percent SD reading by measuring the ringing at the edge of a T rise time bar. The amount of ringing is not expressed directly as a percentage of the bar amplitude. Instead, an amplitude weighting system that yields a percent SD number is used. This is necessary because the severity of the distortion depends not only on the amplitude of the ringing, but also on its distance from the 50% point of the bar. An aberration of a certain size right next to the edge doesn't represent nearly as much distortion as an aberration of the same size much further away. Although the SD number can be calculated from the measured amount of overshoot or undershoot, it is generally measured by using special graticules, such as the one shown on this waveform monitor. To make a measurement with this graticule, which comes with waveform monitors such as the 1480 or 1780R, first make sure you have the right signal. You need a T rise time white bar, which is a 100 IRE bar that has a 10% to 90% rise time of nominally 125 nanoseconds. Many common test signals have white bars with 2T rise times, and those signals aren't suitable for this measurement. The NTC7 composite test signal is a common signal that includes a T rise white bar by definition. To make a measurement, first set the waveform monitor's horizontal magnification to 0.2 microseconds per division. Then position the waveform to pass through point B at the blanking level, point C at the 50% point of the transition, and point W at the top of the bar. Once the waveform is properly positioned, you can observe where it falls with respect to the graticule. The solid graticule lines represent 5% SD, and the dashed lines represent 2% SD. Remember that the largest aberration isn't necessarily the one that determines the amount of distortion. You can see from the graticule that a fairly large overshoot fits into the 5% graticule if it's right next to the transition, while only a small amount of ringing fits inside it further out. Look to see if the waveform touches the graticule at any point to determine the amount of distortion. In this case, the ringing looks like about 4%. Since only 2% and 5% graticule lines are shown, you might need to interpolate to get very precise readings. For small distortions, you can increase the vertical gain in the waveform monitor for greater resolution. When times 5 is selected, the dotted lines represent 0.4% SD and the solid lines represent 1% SD. The 1780R has an electronic short time distortion graticule that can be used in much the same way. To make a measurement, position the waveform to line up vertically with the upper and lower crosses and make sure that the transition passes through the small cross in the center. Then use the large front panel knob to adjust the size of the graticule until it just touches the waveform. At this point, you can read the amount of short time distortion from the screen. For this signal, we get a reading of 3.5% SD. For measuring very small distortions, you can increase the vertical gain in this mode. Measurements are traditionally made on the rising edge of the white bar, but you'll notice that the graticules accommodate both rising and falling edges. It's a good idea to look at both edges, which should be symmetrical if the system is linear. If there are significant nonlinearities in the system, however, the distortions of the two edges will not be symmetrical. There are several other methods of evaluating short time distortions. One fairly simple method involves measuring the pulse to bar ratio, which is simply the ratio between the amplitude of the 2T pulse and the amplitude of the white bar. This doesn't involve as detailed an analysis as the SD graticule method, but it's generally a good indicator of how much short time distortion is present. The basic idea is that if the amplitude of the pulse is not the same as the amplitude of the bar, 
you know that signal components in the short time domain are not being transferred with the same amplitude and phase characteristics as the slower components that make up the white bar. The k-factor rating system is another method of characterizing short time distortions. Although this method isn't widely used in the United States, it's been popular in Europe for many years. The k-factor system maps linear distortions of two t-pulses and line bars onto subjectively determined scales of picture quality. In other words, the various distortions are weighted in terms of their visual impairment to the picture. Sometimes several different parameters are measured, usually k2t, k-pulse to bar, and k-bar, and the largest result is quoted as the amount of k-factor distortion. The most common measurement, however, is K2T, which is often just referred to as K-factor. Special graticules are generally used to obtain K-factor readings. The external graticule that comes with the 1780R includes a 5% K2T limit. It's the dashed line outside the 5% SD line. Like the SD scale, you can see that the K-factor graticule is also amplitude weighted with respect to the time between the pulse center and the distortion. To make a measurement with this graticule, first make sure that you have a 2T pulse and then normalize the pulse height to fit the graticule. Set the horizontal magnification to 0.2 microseconds per division and position the pulse horizontally so that it fits into the little circle at the top. You can obtain a reading by observing where the waveform falls with respect to the graticule. There is also an electronic K-factor graticule in the 1780R. Select K-factor in the measure menu and normalize the pulse height so that the baseline coincides with the dashed line and the pulse top passes through the small cross at the top. Again, 0.2 microseconds is the correct horizontal magnification setting. Now use the large front panel knob to adjust the size of the graticule until it just touches the waveform. At this point, you can read the amount of distortion from the screen, which in this case is 2.4%. Let's review short time distortions and the measurement methods that are used to quantify them. These linear distortions affect signal components in the 125 nanosecond to 1 microsecond range, and no differentiation is made between phase and amplitude distortions. Sine squared pulses and rise times are used to measure short time distortions, which show up as ringing, overshoot, and undershoot. Sine squared pulses are well suited to measurement of band limited television systems because all of their energy is contained below a certain frequency. These pulses are specified in terms of their half amplitude duration, usually in intervals of T, which is 125 nanoseconds for NTSC. Short time distortion measurements are most frequently made with a special graticule that yields a result in percent SD. A T rise time bar is required for this measurement. These distortions can also be measured by measuring pulse-to-bar ratio, or K2T, both of which require a 2T pulse.